Join us to shape that future and achieve a gender equal world. Think equal, build smart, innovate for change. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome again. Please now welcome your Master of Ceremonies, WABC's Eyewitness News Anchor, Shade Berinwa. Good morning, ladies. How are my beautiful, dynamic, fierce, strong, trailblazing women today? There we go. <laughs> And for the few men who are out there, you're dy dynamic as well. So thank you for being here. Welcome to the 2019 United Nations Observance of International Women's Day. And I love celebrating this day, don't you? Yeah, it's really wonderful. I love celebrating our power as women. And you know, and I think when you look at the young girls who are coming up, they are so fearless, so bold. And uh, you know, I, I just think that they're just so full of promise and they're definitely our soldiers of sisterhood of tomorrow. Today is a call to action for everyone to continue to push for complete gender equality. Today, we also pause and celebrate who we are, our achievements, and plot out our course ahead, setting our sights to new territories that we need to achieve. So it is with great pleasure to join you again as host of this special event for a third year. You know, in last year, boy, did we achieve so much, didn't we? In just a short period of time with our collective voice, the Me Too movement, right? Incredible what happened here. Time's up. That's right, it inspired women around the globe to speak up against injustice and inequality in the workplace. Our strength and courage provoked real social change, and we're building on that momentum right now. We have an incredible lineup of speakers today who champion gender equality and who are innovating for change in different ways. But before we move on, I would like to take a moment to introduce to you the eminent dignitaries seated here at the podium. His Excellency, Mr. Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Her Excellency, Ms. Maria Fernanda Espinosa Garces, President of the General Assembly. Her Excellency, Ms. Geraldine Byrne Nason, Chairperson of the Commission on the Status of Women. <laughs> Madame Amina Mohammed, Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations. Madame Maria Luisa Rivera Viotti, Chef de Cabinet. <laughs> Ms. Venus Elagon, Secretary General of Rehabilitation International. <laughs> and lastly, our host for today's wonderful event, Madame Punzile Molabo Naguka, Under Secretary General and Executive Director of UN Women. There's a lot of love in this room for you. <laughs> well, this year's theme for International Women's Day is Think Equal, Build Smart, Innovate for Change, challenging us to think differently by placing innovation at the heart of our efforts to transform progress for gender equality. 
It is not merely enough to have a seat at the table. It is about designing the world that we want to see, that you want to see. We know that as women, we bring different views, we have different talents, we have different perspectives, and we need to be in positions of power so our perspectives shape policy. We do a disservice to ourselves if we aren't giving the same level of encouragement to women and girls to be involved in fields such as science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and design. Fields that have traditionally been dominated by men. And someone who knows something about that is astronaut Dr. Ellen Ochoa, the first Latina female astronaut, and we're gonna hear from her later today. Moving forward, we have to think equal at all times, in all things. And we know pay parity is still a significant issue. The gender pay gap between women and men persists, and it is not where it should be in 2019. Sadly, we are still talking about this issue. Worldwide, women only make 77 cents for every dollar earned by men, and that's gotta change. Like in the video we just watched, we need to remind ourselves to keep thinking outside of the box. Women innovators, inventors, scientists, artists, novelists, and teachers have done just that and have already shaped the world as we know it. From trailblazers such as Dr. Shirley Jackson, a physicist whose research led to the invention of all things telecommunication. Maria Telks, affectionately called Sun Queen, designed the first solar-powered heating system for houses. Grace Hopper, a scientist and U.S. Navy Rear Admiral who was one of the pioneers of computer programming and coined the software terms bug and debugging. And Anne Tsukamoto, one of the first researchers to identify and isolate human stem cells. And we know now there will be many more to follow in the footsteps of these luminaries. And one of them you're going to meet today who is really incredible. She's 16-year-old Kiara Niergan, and she won the Google Science Prize. And her story is basically, she was tired of seeing farmers unable to grow crops in drought prone areas. So she discovered using orange peels was a super absorbent material to help retain water. 16 years old, she comes up with this. Phenomenal. We know that women and girls have a crucial role to play in the design, build, and use of social innovations that shape our societies. In this area of unprecedented growth, science, technology, new creative solutions for a truly gender equal world are right at our fingertips. So join UN Women as we stand with women and girls scientists, entrepreneurs, inventors, and risk takers as they revolutionize future societies and as they build a future that is sustainable, resilient, and accessible to all. So let's continue with our program. Joining us now should actually be a familiar face for those of you who attended last year, or if any of you watched This Is Us on television, 12-year-old singer and actress Drew Olivia Tillman. And uh, Drew is going to be performing Roar. Where are you, Drew? There you are. Take it away. you push me past the breaking point I stood for nothing so I fell for everything you held me down but I got up already brushing off the dust you hear my voice you hear that sound like thunder gonna shake the ground you held me down but I got up 
That was fantastic, Drew. Thank you. We hear you roaring. Thank you. <laughs> you know, you were here last year. Yes. And uh, first of all, you are just such an incredible singer. We've, Thank we've, you. We can really just see how you've just grown just to be a beautiful young lady. I really appreciate it. So what does, what does today mean to you? Today means everything to me. Thank you for everyone who is here today. Um, thank you for having me back. I mean, when we got the call that I was going to be back, I was so excited because last time I was here, you know, um, I was just, I don't want to say that I wasn't that inspired, but then once I heard <laughs> the speakers and- I told you they're unafraid. They'll just I say heard anything. everybody speaking, I was just, like, I was so inspired. It was just, it was like a, a new light to my life. And I know I'm only, I was only 12 years old then, but I mean, still for me to be that young and that, you know, just guided, it just, it meant a lot, a lot to me for you guys to want to be back and well, we for love me to have, be there. So. We love having you here. We Thank love you. having you here. Thank you. Do you have anything to say to all of the young girls who are out there? Never stop chasing your dreams, you know. It'll. That's right. It'll come. It won't come easily. You know, it's not going to come without hard work and without perseverance, but it'll definitely come sooner or later. Trust me and believe <laughs> me, okay? See how wise these young ones are? Well, Drew, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. So you much. were wonderful. Thank we're going to hear from Drew again later today. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is now my honor to welcome the Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Antonio Guterres, to deliver the opening remarks for today's events. Excellencies and dear friends, warm greetings on International Women's Day. This year's observance falls at a time when our world faces many global challenges from climate change, inequality, armed conflict, humanitarian emergencies, to the weakening of commitment to multilateralism. But gender equality and women's rights are fundamental to addressing each of these challenges. We can only reestablish trust and rebuild global solidarity by challenging historic injustices and promoting the rights and dignity of all. We can only achieve sustainable development and peace by drawing on all our assets and capacities. And in recent decades, we have seen remarkable progress on women's rights and leadership. But these gains are far from consistent, and they have sparked a backlash from an entrenched patriarchy. Gender equality is fundamentally a question of power. And we live still in a male-dominated world. And our male-dominated culture has ignored, silenced, and oppressed women for centuries, even millennia. A recently published book draw my attention to the fact that Homer's Odyssey, one of the founding works of Western literature that recounts events that happened more than 3,000 years ago, opens with an account of Telemachus, the son of Odysseus and Penelope, telling his mother, and I quote, to stop talking and go back to weaving at a loom. And we can draw a straight line between that story and the silencing and harassment of women today. Women's political representation in parliaments around the world stands at less than 25%. At the highest level, that drops to 9%. And the Global Media Monitoring Project found that worldwide, just one quarter of the subjects of news stories are women, and most often as victims rather than leaders. And despite women's achievements and successes, their voices are still routinely overlooked and their opinions ignored. We are all paying the price for inequality and oppression. Increasing the number of women decision makers is essential. At the United Nations, I've made these as a personal and urgent priority. We now have gender parity among those who lead our teams around the world. And six months ago, we reached parity in the senior management group, where we have today more women than men, 26 women. 
26 women and 16 men to be precise, placing us well ahead of schedule to achieve the goal of parity in all senior leadership by 2021. Once we're signed that this is an issue of power, lies in the fact that those targeted for sexual harassment are overwhelmingly women. And I've taken steps to address this extremely damaging behavior at the United Nations by focus on prevention, by establishing a new team made up entirely of women dedicated to investigating the allegations rapidly, supporting victims through their trauma, and ensuring accountability for perpetrators. Dear friends, Women still face major obstacles in assessing and exercising power. As the World Bank found, just six economies give women and men equal legal rights in areas that affect their work. At present trends, it will take two centuries to close the gap in economic empowerment, a gap that is widening, not lessening, by the day. And I do not accept a world that tells my granddaughters that economic equality can wait for their granddaughters, granddaughters. I know you agree, our world cannot wait. Everywhere around the world we see two parallel trends. While global movements and increased awareness are contributing to greater acknowledgement of the need for gender equality, this is happening simultaneously with a reinvigorating pushback on women's rights. And this takes multiple forms including increased violence against women rights defenders and women running for political office, to online targeting and harassment of women who speak out. Such attacks are aimed to reinforce women's traditional roles in society and punish, punish those who challenge it. In some countries, homicide rates overall are decreasing, but killing of women are rising. In others, we see a rollback of legal protection against domestic violence and female genital mutilation. And women's participation makes peace agreement more durable, but we still struggle to make sure women are included in negotiating teams. Even governments that are vocal supporters of this agenda fail to back their words with action. Nationalist, populist, and austerity agendas add to inequality with policies that curtail women's rights and cut social services. And we must not give ground that has been won over decades. We must push for wholesale, rapid, and radical change. Dear friends, this year's theme of International Women's Day, Think Equal, Build Smart, and Innovate for Change, addresses infrastructure and systems that have been constructed largely in line with the male-defined culture and celebrates the creativity of women inventors and innovations through history. We need to find ways of remaining and rebuilding our world, reimagining and rebuilding our world so that it works for everyone. Women decision makers in urban planning can support women's rights by designing safe, reliable transport systems. Too often roads and transportation are planned with men's needs in mind, carrying people from the periphery to the urban center rather than between various sites in the periphery, including schools and services and street lighting and bus timetables are not gender neutral. Innovations like mobile payments and e-learning platforms can deliver services directly to women, especially those who are isolated and are too rich. And innovation and technology reflect the people who make them. But women are seriously underrepresented in the fields of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and design. Last month, in Ethiopia, I've spent some time with the African Girls Can Code group. Programs like these not only develop skills, they challenge the stereotypes that limit girls' ambitions and dreams. Dear friends, investing in women and respecting their human rights in, is the surest way to lift communities, companies, and countries, and to achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And the longer we put off gender equality, the more we lose. Next year marks the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Platform for Action and 20 years since the adoption of the Security Council's landmark resolution 1325 on women, peace and security. Our discussions today and at major events in the months ahead can lead the way to gender commitment and action. On this International Women's Day, I call for a new vision of equality and opportunity 
so that half the world's population can contribute to all the world's success. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary General. And now I'd like to invite Her Excellency, Ms. Maria Fernanda Espinosa Garces, President of the General Assembly, to make her statement. Thank you, thank you very, very much. And thank you, Mr. Secretary General, for being a champion feminista of the House. Uh, we really feel very proud of all your, your commitment, uh, your drive, your conviction on women's rights and gender parity. And uh, usually we, we have a formula in the house, and I speak to the ones that are uh, not often uh, here at the UN. We say all protocol observe, not to say the names of everybody sitting at the podium. And uh, today I decided to mention every name of the people sitting at the podium because it's worthwhile. They're all uh, women champions of change, women committed to women's rights, uh, women uh, that fight every day for gender parity. So I will mention them all, uh, especially after, of course, the Secretary General, uh, our very dear friend, Deputy Secretary General, Amina Mohammed. Uh, we feel uh, she's a power in the house, and that's why I'm uh, saying her name out loud. Uh, the Executive Director of UN Women, Pumzile Malambo Nunkuka, uh, also a, a wonderful, wonderful woman, uh, walking the talk on women's rights. Uh, Ambassador Geraldine Bernason, uh, she is not only the PR uh, of uh, Ireland, but the chair of the 63rd session of the Commission of the, on the Status of Women. Uh, and Madame Venus Ilagan, Secretary General of Rehabilitation International. And my dear friend also, Maria Luisa Viotti, a chef de cabinet of the, of the Secretary General. And I'm saying these names because uh, we know, we know that also every victim of rape, of abuse, of human trafficking, of discrimination, they all have names that we, we should remember and we should say them out loud. So we are here also for the victims today. So, queridas hermanas, I am so grateful to uh, you and women for convening this event and for the crucial work you all do every day for women and girls around the world. International Women's Day is an opportunity to reflect on the progress we have made on gender equality and women's empowerment. It is a day to express solidarity with the feministas, women and men who continue to fight discrimination. And it is a day, I confess, I approach with mixed feelings. On the one hand, it is important that we celebrate the gains we have made. Last year, Barbados, Ethiopia, Georgia, Romania, Trinidad and Tobago welcomed their first female leaders. Uruguay saw its first conviction for femicide. Bangladesh banned the degrading two-finger test in rape trials. And the UN, thanks to the Secretary General's leadership, gender parity was achieved within senior management team among the heads of UN country teams and the heads of regional economic commissions. And from Kansas to Kabul, women around the world continue to raise their voices under banners like Me Too, Ni Una Menos, and Where Is My Name? On the other hand, nearly four decades after the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women was adopted nearly 25 years after the landmark Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, we are still not even close to equal. Dear friends, each year, International Women's Day brings it a, a list of depressing statistics. Some 16 million girls will never set foot in a classroom. One in three women has experienced physical or sexual violence. Over 70% of people trafficked are female. On pretty much any measure of development, women are behind. Add in factors like ethnicity, poverty, or disability, and the figures are even worse. For example, women with disabilities are twice as likely to suffer physical violence. More than half of all poor rural women like basic literacy skills. These statistics are shocking, but they will come as no surprise to half of the people in this very room. Every woman and girl 
knows that uh, her lived reality is very different to that of her father or brother. For us, simple things, going to school, deciding what to wear, using the toilet, meeting a male friend, can be matters of life and death. Dear friends, the first International Women's Day celebrations took place over 100 years ago. How much longer can the world afford to leave our potential untapped? We have just 11 years left to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. According to the World Bank, limited educational opportunities for girls are robbing the world of between 15 to $30 trillion in lost productivity. We desperately need to close the gender education gap and get more women into science and technology. We need more inventors like Asa Abdel Hamid Fayad, who at the age of just 16 found a way to convert plastic waste into biofuel, and Kiara Nilging, who also at the age of just 16 used orange peel to develop a low cost material to help soil retain water. <laughs> Kiara is here with us and it is excellent that this event and CSW are putting emphasis on female innovators. Excellencies, supporting innovation, ensuring that the needs and experiences of women and girls are embedded in urban planning, in new technologies. These are practical steps, steps that UN agencies, that governments and communities can take. But clearly, we need to look beyond policies. Several countries have had decades of equal pay legislation, for example, but the gender pay gap will only close in 2086 at the current rate of progress. So what can we do? I believe that there are two things we should prioritize. First, boosting the number and diversity of women in leadership positions. Just 20 countries have female leaders. Less than a quarter of parliamentarians are women. Just 5% of Fortune 500 companies have female CEOs. On the 12th of March, I will be holding a high-level event on women in power, bringing together female world leaders and youth leaders to get them working collectively across generations, regions, and sectors on this goal. And second, increasing our supposed to support to grassroots organizations. Time and again, we have seen that bold actions by leaders requires pressure from below. That was the case with women's suffrage, with the landmine ban, with the treaty on prohibition of nuclear weapons adopted just two years ago. We need to make sure that funding goes to those who really know what is needed on the ground and whose actions guarantee enduring transformation. Dear friends, next year, the international community will celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration in Platform for Action, and rightly so. But we, we should also feel a sense of shame. Far too many women, the vi for too many women, the vision of Beijing remains a distant dream, and the gains we have made are under threat from factors such as discrimination, violence, and soaring inequality. So I hope that the coming months will see the global movement for gender equality grow stronger. We must show our impatience and anger. We must take the fight into our communities and into the corridors of power. Let's, let us not forget Audre Lorde's powerful words. I am not free while any woman is unfree, even when her shackles are very different from my own. Thank you very much. Mm, very nice. Powerful words. Thank you, Your Excellency. Now I would like to invite Her Excellency Ms. Geraldine Byrne Nason, Chairperson of the Commission on the Status of Women, to make her statement. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary General, President of the General Assembly, Executive Director. Sorry, I gather the microphone wasn't on. Good morning, everyone. I'm thrilled to be on the platform this morning with such distinguished uh, panel. Um, I'm here with you, as has been said earlier, as the chair of the Commission on the Status of Women, and I want to wish you all a very happy International Women's Day, 
and I'll do as I always do, take the license of saying that to you in my own language, Irish. Law, either no shunt and aman, honey ye of Galair. The truth is, in the early days of the UN, women were few and far between in this building. It took us quite some time for our voices to be heard and for our messages to register. Yet today, on International Women's Day, there can be no doubt we're here to stay, we're sitting centre stage, and we have absolutely no plans to lower the volume, as we just heard from Drew. Just a few months ago, some of us met here in this room for a poetic moment. I'm Irish, so I'm, I'm licensed to do this, to mark the centenary of Irish women. Ireland's greatest living poet, a woman, Ivan Boland, who happened also to be the daughter of the only ever Irish president of the General Assembly, read from a specially commissioned poem, setting the bar for women for the next hundred years. And I quote from her, our future, will become the past of other women. To ensure that this becomes a reality, we simply have to become the trailblazers. Every step forward we take, we know there is some waiting to place a stone in our shoe to slow us down. We cannot be afraid. We need to push forward, not walk, but run. There are more than enough of us here in this room with global impact to make up a formidable relay team. We must take up the baton from those who have gone before and advance more quickly. Here today, we have the baton now for future generations. Let us not forget the countdown. The race is on. The race to 2020, the race to 2030, the race to 2063. They're well and truly on. We look ahead along that race course to the 25th anniversary of Beijing. And we realized that we have a lot left to do. In 1995, it looked a bit like a marathon. Just 11% of women were parliamentarians. Today, we've heard already just 25% of women globally are parliamentarians. This means that only, and I emphasize only, one in four women currently represent their populations at national level in governments. That's simply not good in parliaments, actually. It's simply not good enough. And it's simply not a reflection where we would have thought we would be 25 years later. It's not a reflection of where we ought to be. At the Beijing World Conference on Women, we saw a whirlpool, a wave that began rippling across the globe. The realization that women's rights are human rights and human rights are women's rights. Today, we ask you to keep that to the forefront as you think equal, build smart and innovate for change. To do that, we need to think big, we need to act big. We have already heard today that girls and women are grossly underrepresented in STEM, but there are also the hidden women in STEM, hidden unrecognized women. Catherine Johnson, who was lauded in recent years for her work at NASA in the 1960s, one of the many hidden figures. I think also of an Irish woman, Jocelyn Bell Burnell, her undergraduate work led to discovering radio pulsars, but her male supervisor was awarded the Nobel Prize. At Jocelyn's school in Ireland then, in the 60s, girls were not permitted to study science. The school curriculum only allowed cooking and cross-stitching, neither of which would be my forte, I admit. <laughs> Thankfully, we've, we've left that behind. But we still, as we've heard from earlier speakers, have many fields to conquer. I call them the six C's. The first C, curricula. We simply need to provide equal opportunities for boys and girls in school curricula. The second C, career. Career information needs to be disseminated. Girls need to know what's possible. The third C, correct. We need correct facilities for girls to ensure school attendance and high achievement. That can be a toilet or a road. The fourth C is caring, caring responsibilities. We need to help women manage caring responsibilities and careers. The fifth C, child care. Child care services are essential. Marian Wright Edelman said you can't be what you can't see. The sixth C is that we need capable role models for success. That's why I'm delighted that later we'll have two science and technology powerhouses with us 
Ellen Ochoa, and the Irish woman Lorraine Tuhul, who speak to you all. Let me personally add two more C's, confidence and courage. We must instill confidence and courage in one another to ensure that we break down these barriers in this great race to equality. I'm proud to be here as the chair of the Commission on the Status of Women, a wonderful, vibrant expression of activism, activism and deliberation. The CSW is really a call to action in its own right. On Monday, over 10,000 extra actors will come to this building from every part of the world, across civil society and government. The theme this year is social protection, access to public services and sustainable infrastructure. These are critical issues that we will consider for the first time ever. We have a real opportunity to break new ground and a chance to agree new normative standards. We're the only international body that can do this. Why is it important that we have social protection and public services? Social protection and public services, simply put, free women up. It empowers women to participate, empowers women to lead, to lead in communities and politics, in peace agreements, to fulfill their potential. Affordable childcare, healthcare, education, these are the real issues we will be discussing in this building in the next two weeks. They're real issues women encounter every day. As it stands, and this figure is a shocking, shameful figure, it will take 217 years to achieve gender parity in pay and employment opportunities if we don't act now. I don't know about you, but I'm far too impatient for that. Right now, there are 130 million girls out of school across the world. That's the same as putting the entire populations of France and Tanzania together and counting them. We simply cannot wait. Just think about it, if every girl was to complete second level education, it would add up to $30 trillion to the global economy. So investing in girls not just makes business sense, but is invests in sustainability for a society and an economy. In other words, in my view, we cannot afford to wait. Here's the thing, no one wins when women and girls get left behind. CSW, in the next two weeks, offers each of us in this room an opportunity to make a real difference. I never tire of saying that those of us in this room are the privileged ones. Let's not squander that privilege. We know that it's when women get involved that things start getting done. On this International Women's Day, as we recommit to future generations of women and girls to come, we need to pick up the pace, blaze that trail towards equality. We need to push forward on hope. As I do that, I'm going to reach right back to the 18th century, to one of the earliest advocates for women's rights, Mary Wollstonecraft, who said, I do not wish women to have power over men, but over themselves. That's all we ask. Frankly, sisters, we can take it from there. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, we can. And as you said, there are more than enough of us to advance more quickly. Her Excellency, thank you for those remarks. Now I would like to invite Ms. Venus Alagon, Secretary General of Rehabilitation International, to make her remarks. Thank you. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I bring to you greetings from my organization, Rehabilitation International, and the global community of persons with disabilities, specifically women and girls. I am greatly honored to address you today, so I convey my sincerest thanks for the organizers of this very important event for the opportunity. I was born and raised in a small community in the northernmost part of the Philippines, situated in one of the 7,100 islands that make up the archipelago that is often battered by tropical cyclones, locally called typhoons, where an average of 26 such typhoons visit most of the islands each year. Living in islands can be challenging for people without disability, so there is no question how challenging it is for those of us with disabilities. 
People who have witnessed me going about the normal activities of my daily life have often wondered how a woman on a wheelchair managed to get education at a time when schools were not accessible, was fortunate to land a job as a media practitioner when people with disabilities were not even considered for jobs and had a successful marriage, including having a son, when women with disabilities were largely regarded as asexual, have no childbearing capabilities, and do not fit the characteristics normally attributed to being a good wife or partner and mother. Those interesting expressions in people's faces when they look at me made me realize the depth of misconception about disability and people's lack of understanding of the subject. For a woman with a disability, the challenges are great but not insurmountable. A woman with a disability is the expert of her own situation. She appreciates her strengths, understands her limitations, and knows by heart how to overcome her challenges. She knows that disability may limit her capacity to physically move from one place to the other, but it will never be something that will dampen her spirit nor diminish her will to pursue her dreams and live them through. For the woman who is determined to overcome her limitations, there could be no barriers that can stop her from prevailing over whatever stands in her way. Today, I speak to you as somebody who has experienced it all, discrimination, exclusion, stigma, oppression, name it. I've been through it as a woman with a disability from a developing country. The journey from my little island home in the Philippines to the mega city of New York was never easy, but something I thought was doable and is possible for one who is determined to succeed. Looking back, I can't help but think about why people make quite a big deal about disability and disabled people. Why can't disability be seen as a normal part of human diversity? After all, every person has a limitation. The only difference is that some have visible limitations and we are labeled persons with disabilities, while others have less visible or even invisible limitations and for whatever reason, they do not want to be called people with disabilities, often because of the stigma that is attached to disability. Disability is not a monolithic issue. It is a social construct that tends to define a group of people rather than making it a norm to be inclusive of all people. Embracing differences and appreciating what each of us can contribute at making life better for everyone. Innovative technologies have led to the emergence of social innovations and innovative products that are transforming assistive devices and services offered to women and girls with disabilities. We need to start seeing more women and girls with disabilities as innovators and entrepreneurs, including prioritizing the education of girls with disabilities and promoting girls in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and design, as have been mentioned a couple of times, so that their perspectives will ensure that new technologies and innovative solutions address shared issues and concerns. It's a win-win for everyone, especially in the emergence of issues associated to current reality of aging populations. Living longer, or living longer lives bring new challenges. The US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention indicate that life expectancy in the country is approaching 79 years. So it's time to think about the challenges that goes with longevity, the need to use wheelchairs, hearing aids, and other assistive devices, the preference to use ramps rather than climbing up stairs, in the inevitability to becoming dependent on others for certain tasks and functions rather than doing this ourselves are just a few of the numerous needs that must be invested 
to meet the needs of all women and girls. In this changing world, it is important to hear directly from us. We have the opportunity to be more inclusive society with innovation and technology. It's time for us to start looking at disabilities as an opportunity to change perspectives and attitudes to give more positive second look in the subject that some of us may have been afraid to even talk about. Accepting disability as a normal part of life would enable us to celebrate our diversity, appreciate our differences, and a chance to embark at finding innovative solutions to challenges that we would eventually face as a result of living longer lives. Acknowledging the shift in paradigms in our understanding of disability issues, one that is extremely intersectional and which affects all of us, will give us the opportunity to prepare for what lies ahead, enabling us to live not just longer lives, but more importantly, meaningful and productive lives. We have the power to make a difference, not just for ourselves, but for others in helping overcome obstacles and barriers created by non-inclusive society. Please help break the barriers. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Alagong, and for representing the voice of those with disabilities. Thank you so much. Well, now it is time to invite Ms. Pumzile Malabo Naguka, Undersecretary General and Executive Director of UN Women, to make her remarks. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Shadi, Secretary General, Excellencies and Sisters, uh, honored guests, friends, happy International Women's Day, sisters and brothers, but especially to SG our leader in chief in championing equality in the United, in the, in the, within the UN. So please clap to yourselves and celebrate International Women's Day. Today, we celebrate the power and potential of women and girls as innovators. We celebrate their creativity in a world characterized by the speed and scale of change. We want innovation and the speed of change to intentionally benefit women and girls. And we want women and girls themselves to be inspired to innovate and influence the whole ecosystem of innovation. Women are not simply consumers of prescribed solution. They also design solutions for whole society, and they are also equipped to address the issues that affect their lives especially. These include the lack of sanitation and hygiene facilities, poor lighting in public spaces where violent and sexual assault is likely, financial exclusion, hard manual farm work in the era of automation and drones. So, these are the issues that women want to see innovation addressing and more. We all cannot accept that. It will take us more than 200 years for us to achieve gender equality and the grandchildren of the grandchildren of the SG's grandchildren mm -hmm. will only be the people that will achieve gender equality, not under our watch. Without intentional action, and the conduit slow pace, however, this is a real risk. We need the giant leap that the 21st century innovation can bring so that we can leapfrog. As we celebrate the 25 years after the adoption of the Beijing Platform for Action, we definitely have to be thinking about the big and the bold steps that will enable us to leapfrog. We need to use big data mobile money, climate smart agriculture technologies, and clean water technologies and application that protect the rights of women and facilitate access to justice. Mobile technology has enabled a range of services 
and represents an unmissable opportunity for development. Access to these proven disruptive technology solutions has to be made universal to all those who need it. It means that our regulators have to be encouraged to regulate for the 21st century, not for the banking industry of the 20th century. There are already 3.3 billion people globally who are now able to use mobile internet. Even though we still have digital divide, gender-based di digital divide. But 80% of women in low and middle income countries now own a mobile phone. With this level of market penetration, it would be a historic mistake to fail to make deliberate use of these technologies to advance gender equality. We know that these technologies are effective. Our own UN Women uh, Initiative on, women, on Buy From Women Enterprise uses mobile technology to connect women farmers and cooperatives to information, finance, and markets, optimizing the supply chain for women. We know that many more women can use this technology. Women, even with limited resources, have been creating solutions for their problems. Building low-cost solar lamps for small businesses and for individual homes and health care. Using these interventions for midwives to make sure that they can deliver babies in the dark at night in homes where there, is no, there are no lights. In Fiji, UN Women and the Raki Raki Market Vendors Association who prov provided the key insights that led to the modernization and rebuilding of the market after tropical cyclone Winston in, uh, had hit that community. The intervention included flood resistant drainage as well as climate smart aspects like rainwater harvesting system and features like changing areas for babies and filming market attendance. So inclusion is important in innovation in order to make sure that the solution are most appropriate. We also need to ensure that we improve, inno uh, we, we improve innovation by including gender equality and gender lens at the source of innovation. And to ensure that we have partnered and formed the, the Global Innovation Coalition for Change with the private sector, integrating gender awareness at all levels of the innovation process. If you like, we are injecting the gender lens in the DNA of innovation because we do not have the capacity to be everywhere, but those who innovate must have a gender lens with them. We also know that algorithms increasingly determine selection and response. We need to make sure that with this growing evidence that women have been routinely left out of the data on which decisions are made is also addressed. Big data is only reliable support for decision making if it draws on a pool of unbiased information. Artificial intelligence cannot be intelligent if it is gender blind. And therefore, we need to address also the, to bring about gender lens in that field. We are working with key partners to improve gender statistics, rebalance those data pools, and tell the real life stories of role models who are women all over the world. I hope those of you who are in New York have seen the virtual reality display in the visitor's hall, a partnership with Google to bring to life the experiences of courageous women human rights defenders and activists and make sure that they are visible to many in the world. And some of them are here with us. Thank you for being here. This, this, is, this is using technology to amplify these stories. And in partnership with Amazon, we are using Alexa's voice activated technology to tell stories of women who are role models, who are bringing about change in the world. Alexa, what's my flash briefing? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, 
Is Alexa here? Here's your flash briefing from UN Women's Stories on Gender Equality. In Nigeria, less than 6% of women hold political positions. Lois Uta wants to change that. Lois was just two years old when polio took away her ability to walk, but she hasn't let her disability get in the way of achieving her dreams. She decided to pursue a position in politics in 2017 after a friend invited her to a political meeting. Lois was inspired to create space for women and people living with disabilities and to show other people with disabilities what is possible. In April 2018, she decided to run for a seat in the House of Representatives in Nigeria. After several consultations with leaders, students, and community members, she received enormous support and became the nominee for her party. Lois advocates for inclusive legislation and providing an enabling environment for persons with disabilities, especially in the area of education. Every day, UN Women works globally to support and empower women like Lois Uta. Learn more at unwomen.org. Those who have Alexa, you can hear a story from us every week about an amazing woman from a different parts of the world. In conclusion, I also want to highlight the fact that yesterday, we launched a partnership with Tencent of China, one of the biggest uh, technology companies, to activate and encourage public giving towards gender equality in China. And again, we would never reach those millions of people if there wasn't innovation and we were not using technology to address the issues that affect women. Innovation is a key component of development and a far-reaching enabler of rights. It has to be treated as a right, not a privilege. Innovation is a life-saving basic need for those who live in poverty. Women and girls have a vital role to play in the fourth industrial revolution, shaping the policies, services, and infrastructure that impact their lives. Today, we call for intentional innovation multiplied so that technology can raise the voices of many more women like Loi Auta of Nigeria and change lives irreversibly. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Executive Director. And thank you very much to all of our speakers for your inspirational words. And thank you, especially Secretary General, who will now be departing. Thank you for coming today and lending your voice and your continued support. Thank you very much. And, you know, Drew was just so fabulous. I think we need to have her back again. Uh, please welcome Drew Tillman, who will be performing Brave. Are all my ladies ready to be brave in 2019? Let me hear you say yeah! You can be amazing, you can turn a phrase into a weapon or a drug. You could be the outcast or be the backlash for somebody's lack of love. Or you can start speaking up. Nothing's gonna hurt you the way the words do. And they said on need your skin, caps on the end. And no sunlight, sometimes the shadowing. But I wonder what would happen if you say what you want to say and let the words fall out. Holding your toes. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. She was wonderful, wasn't she? I mean, she's just like elevated the whole room, all of this energy. Drew, thank you so much. It's so good to have you here again with us. And remember, we can watch, we can catch you, right? When is the TV show? Okay, all right. Even, the, even though I'm an ABC girl, you know, but, but there's still love there at NBC, as well as CNN. CNN's in the house as well. <laughs> well, thank you all, thank you all. I know uh, everyone has to make their way, but again, thank you all for your support and your involvement. Secretary General, thank you again. And I just want to take a moment while they make their way out. I just want to thank all of the volunteers who helped make today happen. Where are some of the volunteers? Can you just stand a, a minute? They're here. They're here. They're just too shy to stand up. There's some up there. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. And I see a, one man there. Thank you. Thank you for your support. <laughs> well, you know, we're talking about brave and brave certainly describes our keynote speaker today. She's a veteran astronaut who has flown in space four times and logged nearly a thousand hours in orbit. She's an engineer, an inventor who holds four patents, the former director of the Johnson Space Center who's been recognized with NASA's highest honor, the Distinguished Service Medal. And she makes all of us proud having made history as the first Hispanic woman to go to space. Let's take a look. hear it. Now we just need to see it. Okay, we're, we're, we're going to try this. Uh, we're going to try this again. Clearly, we're just having a, a few technical problems. Are we going to try to cue that up again?
pretty cool. <laughs> Please welcome Dr. Ellen Ochoa. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's so great having you here. Well, thank you so much. I am so honored to be here today to address you as part of the UN's official commemoration of International Women's Day. You know, I've been really, really fortunate to play a visible role in human space exploration, and in particular with the International Space Station, a laboratory where women and men engage in science and technology research and development for the benefit of humanity. We need all the brightest minds on this journey, which is why encouraging girls and women in STEM fields is so important. And I think my experience really does embody your theme of think equal, build smart, and innovate for change. So I wanted to talk a little bit about my story and then talk a little bit more about women and the space program and really how that applies to the UN's sustainable development goals. Uh, I was told by my mother pretty much my whole life how important education was. And uh, she was also somebody who loved learning, never had the chance to go to college when she was young. But she took a, a class a semester um, every year for about 20 years while um, she was raising my four brothers and sisters and me and ended up graduating from college about two years after I did. So she was a huge influence in my life. I did go off to college, wasn't sure what I was gonna major in. Um, but just knew that working hard in school was one of the things that I could do that would really affect my future. Uh, when I was an undergraduate, and I had just recently sort of changed to a science field to study physics, the first astronauts that were uh, selected specifically for the space shuttle program were announced. And of course, that was the first class that included women astronauts and included minority astronauts. And that was a really big deal. And uh, I had just gotten into science, so I wasn't really thinking at all about the space program, didn't really know, um, you know how people got into it. But I became interested in engineering and in being a research engineer and being able to participate in discovery and in developing technology that could be used. So I ended up going off to Stanford for graduate school. And the very first year I was there was when the space shuttle flew for the first time. And of course it was a very different kind of spacecraft than we had ever had before. And it was capable of many, many different things. And of course a lot of it was designed to do science research in space. A couple years later, let's see if we can move to the next one, there we go. Um, Sally Ride flew in space. I'm sure a lot of you uh, remember that or know of it, 1983, of course the first American woman in space. And that made a big impression on me. Um, she had been a physics major like I had. She had also gone to Stanford, which is where I was currently studying. And so it, it made a difference that somebody that I could relate to in some way um, was now in space and participating in you know, the US space program. So I ended up um, completing my education. Oh, I guess I, uh, I wanted to add this slide here. Um, I'll, I'll come back to it a little bit later, but uh, I did want to mention that um, I was able to be on a presidential commission for the celebration of women in American history. And this was in 1998. And it was uh, basically in celebration of the 150th anniversary of the first women's suffrage convention in the United States. And uh, I flew in space the next year and I got to take with me this uh, flag from the National Women's Party. So this flag was used um, as women were fighting for the right to vote. Uh, in the United States. And on this particular mission, we had three women, two NASA astronauts and a Canadian astronaut. And uh, we got to unfurl this flag in the middle of the International Space Station. And to me, that was a very uh, symbolic uh, role that I got to play in space. So, 
in graduate school, I decided I wanted to apply for the astronaut program. Didn't really think I'd ever hear back from NASA, but I wait until I got my PhD. And as I think we all understand, education you know, is really the key for women achieving uh, gender parity, gender equality, and is so important. And I do want to thank the people that supported me, um, not just my family that you see here in this picture, but I had two really great um, dissertation advisors at Stanford University um, who supported me and to this day um, you know, are uh, mentors for me and friends and have followed along with me throughout my career. So I uh, applied, but uh, NASA only selects astronauts every few years, so I went off to a research engineering position at Sandia National Labs. And I had the opportunity to, uh, to interview for the astronaut program and spend a week at Johnson Space Center, which was amazing. Uh, first time I had ever gotten to be there. So I wasn't selected that year, but I was encouraged to keep my application updated so that the next time they did a selection, um, I would still be able to be considered. And a few years later, they did do an another selection. And so five years after I initially applied, uh, I was accepted into the astronaut program. And uh, by that time, women had been in the office for about 12 years. And so I think a lot of the initial, you know, probably skepticism of how women would, would do as astronauts was, was already past us. And of course, a lot of that was due to the, the great work of the women astronauts who came before me. Uh, and so I had the opportunity in the time that I was in the astronaut office to, to just do all kinds of amazing things. And I got to fly on four flights. Um, the first two flights were really about studying the Earth. It was part of NASA's program called Mission to Planet Earth. And we were in particular studying the atmosphere and the problem of ozone hole and ozone depletion. And I was gonna show um, just a couple of pictures from this flight. On all four of my missions, I had the opportunity to use the robot arm that comes to us from Canada. So this is me at the controls of the robot arm. I also got an opportunity to play my flute in space, something that was important to me. I know we all have hobbies that are important to us and I, um, we actually shot some footage um, that was used in an educational video um, for uh, elementary school students about what it's like to live and work in space. My second two flights, my third and fourth flights, were part of building the International Space Station. And really, a, quite a bit of my career was associated with the space station. Um, so on uh, STS-96, the station looked like what you see on the left right there. It was just um, two modules, one Russian, one American. Nobody was living on board yet because uh, we didn't have a habitation module. And our flight was going up to transfer a bunch of supplies, both inside and outside, to prepare for the first crew. Then I got to go back three years later. And, th and th what the station looked like at that point, you see in the middle picture, and we added the very first piece of the truss structure. It's about 42, 43 feet long. And we needed to build this out to about 350 feet long and add more solar rays so that we could power all the laboratories. At this point, we just had one laboratory that was provided by the United States. And now we have two others from Europe and from Japan. And we needed to make sure we had enough power to be able to support all the science that was gonna do. And so we were the sort of the first part of that next phase of the station. And then on the right, you see what the station looks like today. Um, if you overlaid it on a, on a US football field, it's about the same size, uh, both in length and in width when you count the solar rays. And we've had people in space um, for over uh, 18 years. Let me show a few um, photos from those slides. Um, this is a slide from that, that same mission that I showed you with the flag. Because the uh, station was under construction, we bought these, uh, brought these construction signs with us um, as we were operating in the middle of the International Space Station. And then here's the flag again. That's uh, Tammy Jernigan on the right and uh, Julie Payette, Canadian astronaut in the middle. And many of you may be aware that uh, Julie is now the Governor General of Canada. This is a view um, 
in the Russian side of the space station where there was a nice window where we could look out um, on the Earth from there. And uh, when I came back from my first mission of assembling the International Space Station, I was met by, by my little guy who turned uh, one year old that week. And uh, you know, one of the things I wanted to mention was uh, how important it is that um, women are able to have the ability to have kids, have chi uh, quality childcare in order to contribute fully in the, in the jobs that we can do, that we want to do, that we should be doing. And I was able to, to do that while I was at NASA. This was uh, right before my final mission. Um, my younger son turned two while I was in orbit, so I got to say happy birthday from there. I'm pretty sure he had no idea what was going on. Um, but it was a fun memory for me. So after I came back from my fourth mission, we had the, um, I had the opportunity to go into ver a variety of management and leadership roles at Johnson Space Center. And it culminated with about five and a half years as the director of Johnson Space Center, something I could never have imagined when I first visited there uh, many years before uh, as I was applying to the astronaut program. And in that role, I had the opportunity to do a variety of things. Of course, we were supporting the International Space Station, developing a new spacecraft called Orion. We're responsible for human health and performance in space. Uh, but I was also responsible for our workforce and um, for ensuring that people had opportunities and that men and women and underrepresented minorities in STEM had the opportunity for training and development and to um, go into management and leadership roles. One of the things that NASA did um, during these years was set up a website called Women at NASA. And there's just a whole bunch of stories of different women there in their own words about kind of you know, the path that they took to get to their particular position at NASA. And it's something that's available for anybody to look at, um, for people all around the world, women and girls, anybody who's interested. And uh, so I wanted to make sure that you knew about that because I think it is important to hear from other women and realize that really everybody has a different story to tell. Wanted to talk about some of the other amazing women at NASA. Um, a couple of the astronauts who have spent um, six months or more on the International Space Station, um, you know, are people that I just really admire. On the left is Dr. Kate Rubens. She has a PhD in cancer biology and also worked um, on infectious diseases, including the Ebola virus, before we, she was selected as an astronaut. And then she spent um, six months on the International Space Station. And one of the experiments she got to do for the very first time in space was to sequence DNA. And uh, with her background, she was the perfect astronaut to have on board while we were doing that. And so this opens up a lot of research that we can now do in space that we couldn't do before because we now have the ability, the equipment to do it. And it's also really important for long duration travel where we can monitor astronaut health as well as the health of the spacecraft itself. On the right is Dr. Peggy Whitson, and you may know about her because she has spent more time in space than any NASA astronaut, man or woman. Three long duration missions on the International Space Station. She was the first woman commander of the International Space Station, the first woman to be chief of the astronaut office at NASA. Um, really just an incredible legacy. And she has a PhD in biochemistry. And of course, all the astronauts do experiments in all different kinds of fields, but it's always great when somebody is up there with a particular expertise. And she was um, doing part of a genes in space um, experiment here in this photo. So it's really just some amazing women who have contributed to human space flight. Overall, um, the motto of the International Space Station is off the Earth for the Earth. And so the things that we do in space are really, um, in most part, designed to understand how we can benefit people on Earth. And I wanted to give just a few examples. Of course, on the space station, we have to have um, a system that's mostly regenerative, where we can reuse water, where we can clean our air and use it again. Uh, because we can't be bringing up supplies all the time. And so we do have a, a water recycling system. It um, collects urine, it collects sweat, and it recycles it into water that can be used for drinking. 
um, as, as one of our astronauts likes to say, we turn yesterday's coffee into today's coffee. <laughs> but the system that we use, the technology that we use to do that is also being used here on Earth, and it's being used in rural regions to provide clean drinking water at schools and um, other facilities. So it really speaks to the, the clean water sustainable development goal. Um, we've also done a lot of work on the immune system and on things like the development of vaccines in space, and you can grow them in um, a more perfect form. Um, uh, protein crystals um, grow more perfectly in space without uh, the effects of gravity, and so there are actually some vaccines in development that are based on research that has gone on in the ISS. So again, applying to another SDG and good health and well-being. And then at Johnson Space Center, we've also been developing robots that could act as astronaut assistants, where we can use them to do what we call dangerous, dirty, or dull jobs and uh, free up astronauts um, to, be, to be doing the work that really takes the analytical work um, that humans are so good at. With the um, research and development work that's been done at NASA and in space, as I say, we've had people in space continuously for over 18 years now. Much of this work affects the sustainable development goals that the UN has signed on to that has been adopted by world leaders. And that includes other things like imagery of the Earth that aids farmers and that provides evidence of climate change and deforestation and helps us understand how the earth is changing and how we might be able to uh, uh, mitigate the impacts of that. So I think I have one final slide here, another view of the International Space Station. And I wanted to just leave you with the message that we need not just the women that I've showed you today at NASA, but women all around the world to be able to bring their ideas and leadership to make progress on these goals. And I really want to applaud the efforts of UN women to work toward gender equality, to support all of the sustainable development goals. And I thank you all for the privilege today of addressing you on International Women's Day. I mean, do you believe this? She actually went to space. It's pretty incredible. I mean, I just think that is the coolest thing. That is just so cool. Well, Dr. Cho, I just wanted to speak with you a little bit. No, come on over. You know, okay. you've, you've led such an inspirational life. You've been such a trailblazer for young women and girls. Uh, I, I just think it's fascinating. I know in part of the research about you, I came across something that said it took you three times to get into NASA. Talk about perseverance. Talk about that a bit. Well, um, you know, so many people apply to the astronaut program, or so few are f selected, that I, I felt just really, really fortunate even to be interviewed. And I, as I mentioned, I wasn't selected the first time, but I was encouraged to apply again. And, uh, you know, people said, well, what did it feel like to fail? And I said, well, I can't say I really felt like I failed, because I figured the odds were so astronomical to begin with mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, okay, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, Pun intended. But, you know, I learned more about NASA, and, and what I ended up doing in the meantime was going to work for NASA just because I supported what they did. I wanted to be part of what NASA was doing as an organization. Mm -hmm. So I became a, a research engineer at NASA and then also a supervisor of a research group. Then had the opportunity to um, apply again. Okay, and so then get this selected. is time number two. <laughs> time number two, and there are thousands of people who are actually trying to get into this program, and you got a big fat. Well, actually, I got selected the second time. You got selected yeah, the second yeah, time, yes. okay. Yeah, it was. The second time, okay. Yes. <laughs> I thought I read it was three times you tried to get Yeah, I've read that too, but I don't know where it came from. Okay, <laughs> all right, all right. Well, we need to change that. That's why you can't trust everything you read online. Uh, but, but still, you, you know, your story is one of perseverance and to say, you know, don't give up. Keep pushing ahead. Well, you know, we wanted to, uh, we asked a couple of questions to people. Okay. We asked UN Women social media followers if they had any questions for you. And we heard from a fifth grade reading and social studies teacher who said, we are studying you in my reading class this week. And my students want to know what it's like to be an inspiration to so many girls. What should I do if my dream is to run the Johnson Space Center at NASA? <laughs> okay, take it away. Well, first of all, that's an awesome dream. Um, 
you know, it was just uh, an amazing job to be director of Johnson Space Center, which we have just such a talented team, men mm -hmm. and women, and you know, all different backgrounds. Um, I, I couldn't imagine just ever having that privilege. And, and I tried to describe a little bit what it meant when I saw women flying in space, mm -hmm. um, that it was just very hard to picture until I saw that. And of course, when I, most of the time when I was growing up and even when I entered college, um, women weren't or They weren't allowed to no, be astronauts. No, they weren't. And, and again, thank you to so many people because it was only, you know, people, um, activists working year after year to change rules, change laws, um, to, to get that access for women. And so knowing how important it was to me, it's, you know, it's amazing to me that now I can serve as that for, for other girls, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, not just around the country, but around the world who are dreaming big dreams to say, go for it, absolutely mm -hmm. go for it. We need you, we need your brains, we need your creativity, um, steady math and science, but, but also, you know, how to communicate. Um, you know, there are so many skills that are important and teamwork, of course, is a big skill, important for astronauts, but it's important to get any kind of the work that um, you all do here done as well. Well, you've been such a pioneer. We want to take uh, one last question from the floor. Who has a question? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, hi, oh, very good morning. I'm really, really inspired and impressed. I am really glad that I can share this important day with you and presence of you, and I now I can inspire m much many more girls in STEM. So I'm, my name is Apasna Johan, and I'm a UN Youth Representative of Man Up Campaign, where we work to engage men and boys to achieve gender equality. And I also represent UNMGCY for SDG5. So back in 2004, when I announced to my community that I would like to pursue engineering, I was told to m by my community that engineering is not for girls, and I should just focus on home science and not computer science. <laughs> so. But a woman, my mom, of course, stood by me and fought for me. And this year, I'll complete 10 years working with multiple Fortune 500 organizations and banks in IT and banking. And oh yes, I'm married to an amazing feminist husband, and <laughs> we are taking care of, together taking care of the home science. <laughs> <laughs> so as per stats, women are less likely to enter and more likely to leave STEM careers. Mm -hmm. And STEM fields have fewer women on boards as well, as compared to other industries. So my question for you is, how has the landscape for women and girls pursuing STEM changed since the beginning of your career? And how do we ensure women and girls lead in this field? Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, first of all, congratulations on everything that, that you've achieved as well. And, and I think you and I and many people in this room heard some of those same things as we were starting off in our educational careers. Um, you know, uh, the landscape has changed. So on the one hand, there's a lot of good news. And certainly during the 30 years that I was at NASA, um, I saw women move into all kinds of visible roles, leadership roles that they had never been in before when I first started at NASA. And, uh, and when I was director of Johnson Space Center, um, you know, the head of our engineering organization, which is our largest engineering, uh, was a woman, and now the chief of the flight director office, so that's the person that really runs uh, mission control um, during missions, is a woman. And so, you, you know, you see women in those visible leadership roles really all throughout NASA, and so I'm really glad to see that. But I think we all know, we all see, that we're, s we're not where we need, need to be, and we're not even where we thought we would be. When I look back, you know, 25, 30 years, where I thought we would be 25 or 30 years later. And so it, it starts early. You know, in middle school, um, girls often start hearing about, oh, math or science is hard. And it's funny, they never heard that in elementary school necessarily, and it wasn't hard. So I don't know what happens, but we have to realize that, you know, people have the skills, they have the interests. And, and engineering and technology development and innovation, it's about curiosity, it's about creativity, it's about working with teams, it's about solving problems. Girls love to do those <laughs> things. And so part of it, I think, is changing the conversation and, and, and getting them to understand what it is that engineering and science is about and how it really does um, reach out to the very things that interest them. Thank you for your question. Great, thank you. And Dr. Ochoa, thank you so much for joining us today. Your story is so inspiring. And, and thank you for being a beacon of light to so many young, young girls coming up. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank, thank you. you, thank you.
Thank you so much. Thank you. You're wonderful. She was great, wasn't she? Well, I think it's time for just some more music. Why not, right? Uh, New York City is famous for its breadth of uh, performance genres, among them opera. To help us celebrate International Women's Day, we are honored to have two opera's finest with us today. She's an acclaimed award-winning soprano who has performed the leading soprano roles in classics like Madame Butterfly, La Boheme, and he's a tenor that has been praised by critics around the globe and sung with prestigious companies such as La Scala in Milan to perform a duet from La Traviata. Please welcome Everett Subtle and Indira Mahajan. Hi everybody, a big round of applause for them. And I'd also, <laughs> I'd also like to say that they, they're very special to us. I'm in a choir, which is called the Schiller Institute Choir, where many of us are here and they sing with us often. So when we perform, we last performed at Carnegie on the 18th of December. And so this is a brotherhood and a sisterhood 
And we'd like to especially thank all the members of the choir who are here, and of course you who have always accompanied the choir. So thank you very much. Thank you, Aparna. And speaking of sisterhood, I have Aisha Shisei here, anchor and correspondent for CNN International to moderate the next panel discussion. Thank you so much for that welcome. Thank you. Um, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, all, port all protocols observed. Um, it is such an honor and a privilege to be here with you today. Um, before we get going, brothers and sisters, can I just ask you one more time to put your hands together as I pick up some paper? Um. And to raise the roof on this International Women's Day. Now, thank you for that. We've got to keep the energy levels high in this chamber. Um, we have a wonderful panel pulled together for you today by UN Women, and I'd like to ask the panelists to, to please join us uh, on the dais and to make their way while I, I tell us a little bit more about who we have. Um, this panel is really going to focus on the theme of the day, Think Equal, Build Smart, Innovate for Change. Uh, and these are some incredible women who will give you some unique perspectives on what we can do to move the needle forward for women and girls in STEM. STEM, of course, being science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So while the ladies get settled on the dais, uh, I just want to say it is such a privilege to be here marking this day um, with you and uh, to really look at how we can move forward, how we can accelerate the change, why innovation is so important to this drive for gender equality. So let me start by introducing who we have on the desk uh, with us today who, who are gonna shape this conversation. Of course, I'm pleased to welcome back um, Pumzele Malamba Nkuka, the United Nations Under Secretary General and Executive Director of UN Women. Please give them a round of applause and make them welcome, make them feel welcome. Uh, Her Excellency, Ms. Penelope Beckles, permanent representative of Trinidad and Tobago to the United Nations. She is president of the UN Women Executive Board. <laughs> Kiara Nurjan, she's a student, scientist, and innovator. She is quite simply amazing. And she's only 19 years old, which makes me feel very old indeed. <laughs> Uh, at 16, Kiara won the grand prize at the Google Science Fair and the Community Impact Award with her solution to the worldwide drought. Kiara was recently named one of the United Nations Young Champions of the Earth and one of the 50 most inspiring women in technology. And she's just 19, ladies and gentlemen. And Dr. Elizabeth Hausler um, is the founder and CEO of Build Change. She's the founder and CEO of Build Change, which is a global expert. She's a global expert on resilient building and post-disaster reconstruction. She uh, launched Build Change in 2004, and its mission is to design disaster-resistant structures using inexpensive local materials and then train homeowners and craftsmen in best construction practices. And last but not least, Lorraine Tuhill, Chief Marketing Officer for Google. As Google's Chief Marketing Officer, she's responsible for telling the evolving story of Google's brand, helping businesses grow, and bringing Google's products to life for billions of users every day. She's passionate about the use of technology for good. Welcome, welcome to you all. All right, so my very first question is obviously to the executive director of UN Women. It is your day, so <laughs> you get to go first. Um, I mean, as we talk about the theme for the day, for this International Women's Day, think equal, build smart, innovate for change. Can you just help everyone here in the chamber watching around the world, help them understand what this theme means, how it resonates in this quest for a gender equal world? Thank you very much, Isha, uh, and thank you for, to everybody who has already 
uh, helped us to understand the theme, the importance of innovation, and how it is important for women for us to bring about the changes that we need to bring about, especially fast and in scale. That is the point we want to drive today, that the changes that are needed in the world do not be, depend on baby steps. Uh, that we are so behind, that there's a threat that we're going to take another 200 years having workshops, not under our watch. After we have been able to learn what we have learned, to understand what works, to see the power of technology, we have to change the way we think and the way we work. And that is why we actually indulge ourselves with a trip to space, because we have to conquer space in order to conquer the problems that we have in scale. We want to sit here and inspire a young girl, as I think we did, somewhere in the world who is watching, who's going to say, I want to do this. Because then we are raising the bar for everybody. We are also trying to show that there are technologies that are accessible and available already. Mobile technology is probably one of the most invasive form of technology that women know how to use. But we have to make it work to address the real and significant issues that impact on women. So in the next coming days, also in CSW, we're going to be talking to regulators, to innovators, to users, in order to make sure that the existence of this technology is a game changer in a qualitative way to women's lives. And we want to also send a message that says innovation and technology is not a cute thing to have. It's not something that is for rich people. It is something that governments and ourselves must look at as a pro-poor infrastructure to address fundamental poverty and to address the issues that the SDGs are raising. So I'm desperate for you to think big, do big, and claim the space for women and girls all over the world. Thank you. Thank you for that, Madam Executive Director. If I could turn my attention to uh, Ms. Penelope Beckles uh, and get your view. Obviously, we understand the need for technology and innovation to be at the center of the effort to push for gender equality. But why is it important to have women and girls involved in STEM and that effort? Okay, um, I'm sure the statistics, you, we all know that at least 50% of the world, you know, women. Um, <laughs> that's first and foremost. Now, I, I come from a small country, 1.3 million people. Um, and in our, in the University of the West Indies, where I graduated, in, uh, when the university started more than 60 years ago, 30% of the attendees were women. Um, 60 years later, we are looking at almost 60%. Um, in Trinidad and Tobago, we started in the oil sector more than 100 years ago. Uh, our first prime minister, when we got independence in 1962, used our oil dollars for education. Um, this year is 31 years since I was called to the bar as an attorney at law, and I was fortunate to have free uh, primary, secondary, and tertiary education. Um, that made a big difference. Now, at the University of the West Indies, um, women are, are predominate in all the faculties, save and except engineering. Um, even in the fields of medicine and law, you have as much as two-thirds women attending. Um, so that has been very, very important for us. Um, in terms of science, uh, Trinidad and Tobago, we, are, we have been very fortunate in that there is a uh, Camille Waldrop Allen, she is a rocket designer, space scientist, and she is one of the most recognized women in aerospace engineering, and one of the first women in color to serve at a senior level at NASA. Um, for us in a small country, having produced um, someone of her caliber, we, we are extremely proud of her. 
Um, if, you, if we discuss issues of health, issues of sports, we understand the important role that leadership plays. The issue of gender and science, if, we, if I can be very simple and ask um, all of you here, particularly your parents, when it's time to give your daughter or your son a gift for Christmas, um, what do you think about? Um, you know, I can't do the poll very quickly, but I just want to say in a very simple way, even those decisions make a big difference in terms of the choices that girls and boys make. Mm -hmm. So we know that very often it's the doll, it's, um, it's caring, it's nurturing, which very often influences us into nursing, into teaching, um, and into a lot of the professions that deal with looking after the society. How many of you give your girl children a geometry set, um, telescope, um, some scientific equipment? Um, I suppose I'm just saying that so you can reflect. Um, those things transfer into the decisions that are made in terms of research, healthcare, um, and women are very often not involved in that type of decision making. So we were very fortunate today in terms of um, seeing a woman that uh, went into space. But if we look at the data, um, we realize even in terms of the Nobel Prize for mathematics, um, for almost 100 years, only one woman received that mathematic prize. So I know I just have three minutes, but I just want to say that 50% of the world is made up of women. And it's a simple question. Why can't we have more women in science if we make up half of the world? It's always a question of choices, but I think we all have to take some personal responsibility as parents, as sisters, as leaders, in terms of the role models. When you, you know, do we take women, do we take girls, uh, to the places where they will see women as role models. And even if we take them, they may not really see a lot of women involved in science. So I really challenge you today, um, as we on International Women's Day, for us to make a conscious effort to ensure that women have that right, that they have that opportunity to choose to get into the field of science. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Ambassador Beckles, for laying it out in simple, stark terms that we can all grasp. And you made me go through my mind of all the gifts I got as a child, which <laughs> tend to be cooking sets. And yet I can't cook, so clearly. <laughs> um, moving on to Lorraine Tuhill. Um, if I could bring you here into the conversation. Um, we, we understand the need. We understand the need to have women at the center of, of, of tech and, and innovation. Can you put it in the context of Google? for us and what Google is doing for women and why this is so important to the company and I know it's important to you personally. It is, thank you so much. And first of all, can I start by saying what a privilege it is to be here on behalf of Google, especially on behalf of all of the many women at Google, we're quite the force. Um, and uh, uh, Innovate for Change is, <laughs> we are that company. It's obviously in our DNA, it's who we are. So uh, we, we're good at that. So we're, we're proud to, to partner with you and your team and, 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 to, and to be here. But, but long before Google, as a child growing up in rural Ireland in the 70s, I never in my wildest dreams imagined I'd ever be here, so it's quite, a, quite an experience. And I can't cook either, so it's a, <laughs> clearly a theme. But my kids who are here with me can attest to that. <laughs> but I just want to say to my kids, uh, you just heard the coolest astronaut ever say that you have to work hard at school, okay? <laughs> you heard it here. <laughs> um, and Chiara, you know, we're so proud you won our science fair three years ago. Google Science Fair is just one of the many programs we have in STEM and in, in computer science and in science to get more and more girls and young women in, into science and into coding and into STEM. And Chiara's looking for an internship soon, so I, I gave her my email address. <laughs> uh, um, and uh, actually, I was proud to tell Chiara that five out of the last six Grand Prix winners of our science fair were actually girls, which is, a, is, a, is remarkable. Yeah. Um, woo! But, but, but our main focus globally is to get more women online. That is our main, our, our main focus, to get more women access to information. Today in the world, there are 250 million fewer women online than men, and, and that's not okay. Mm -hmm. 
That means that the gap is widening, and it means they have no access to information. They cannot learn. They don't know their fundamental human rights. They cannot grow. They cannot create a business. They cannot participate. Uh, and to me, inf information is oxygen. That's why, that's why we care so much. That's why, it's why I care so much. And so that's why we have, an, we, have a, we have a number of initiatives in 39 countries around the world as part of our Women's Will uh, program. I'll just give a few examples. Um, in India, we're very excited about the numbers coming online, but in rural India, 70% of the people online are men. So we launched Internet Sati with Tata Trust, uh, uh, and uh, the, the program so far in the last few years, we've reached over 23 million women, over, uh, over 200,000 villages, and I'm super proud uh, of our progress. And it's remarkable to see how these women, as, the, as, as the op their eyes are opened and they discover the internet, the things they do. Mm -hmm. The biggest use case we see is they can now help their children do their homework mm -hmm. for the first time and prepare for tests. In fact, one in five of our Internet Sati women go on to create their own little business in their community. So it's so amazing when you do give women technology, what they do with it is, is remarkable. We see the same in Africa. Over the next two decades, more, women will, more, more people will enter the workforce in Africa than in anywhere else in the world. Um, so we have a goal to train 10 million Africans in digital skills by 2020. Um, and we want to make sure that we have 50-50 male-female participation. And we're at 48%, so we're, we're almost there. Um, and we offer women dedicated digital skills programs, dedicated community events, foster, uh, fostering mentorship. Um, and we run these women-focused women programs already in four African countries, including Nigeria and Kenya. And today we're proud to announce four new countries, South Africa, Tanzania, Ghana, and Rwanda, which is exciting for us. Um, another example from the Middle East, uh, by next year, one in five jobs in the Middle East will require digital skills. Mm -hmm. And right now in the Middle East today, there are 30 million university-educated internet connected women with no jobs. So we created, which is wrong, it's just completely wrong. So, so we launched Maharat Min Google to help give them digital skills and to help give them the skills they need to advocate for themselves and to participate in that workforce. One amazing example we saw was Reen Fauzi from Egypt who founded Egypt's pink taxi, safe women dri driven taxis for, for women. Um, she used digital skills to grow her business. She now employs hundreds of, of women. So those, those are some of the programs that, that we're running, but beyond our programs, and you mentioned this earlier from Zile, you know, really at a company like ours, what we really have to make sure we do very, very well is that we build products for everyone. And so that's why we are very focused on machine learning uh, fairness, assuming, is ensuring no unconscious bias in our products. And this relates to gender, but it's not just gender, it's also race, ethnicity, nationality, income. Um, we have a whole team staffed off, staff, staffed off around this, uh, led by remarkable women, which is, which, is, which is great. So I think we can all agree that human rights are women's rights, but I feel very, very personally that digital rights are women's rights, and women's rights are digital rights, so that's, that's my focus. Thank you so much for that, Celine. Thank you. Kiara, I've been looking forward to hearing from you and hearing your story. You are a young woman from South Africa, and you have made... I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you did a little bit. Um, who's made a remarkable impact at such a young age. So, you know, I don't want to take you all the way back to your origin story, but I am interested, and I know we all are here, in understanding what first spurred your interest in science and innovation. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey? Right. Um, I think before I wanted to start, I wanted to say what a big privilege it is to sit in this room with such amazing women. Um, being only 19 years old and sitting across these amazing women, I'm truly inspired. Um, and I know that sitting here today, I'm not just representing uh, myself, I'm representing all my sisters that don't have voices. Um, as a South African, I'm, a, I'm representing all the people back home that couldn't be here, but that definitely need the UN women and their um, programs to get their rights. Um, I think from my family, um, I was always brought up in a space where I could achieve whatever I wanted to. I remember telling my mom and dad at a very young age that I wanted to change the world and my mom and dad said, okay, that's great, let's do it. Um, so I think that I was always very supported in my family structure, and that's not just having a mother that's a great role model, but I think by getting young women involved in STEM, it's more important to also see how their fathers can play a role. 
and my father also always inspired me to follow my dreams. I remember, because I'm currently a student at Stanford, that when he took the decision <laughs> to, when my mom and dad took the decision to send me all the way here, um, my dad told me that he's not, it, it's a difficult decision, not because I'm his daughter, but because I'm a child, his child. And that's the reason that when parents look at their children get involved in innovation, they shouldn't see it as girls, but just as children that are interested in innovation and creating change. I think when I was young, I was always interested in asking questions and seeing the world around me, and often I would be disappointed that a lot of the problems I was looking at were not being solved. Mm -hmm. And I think I took this disappointment into seeing what I could answer and how I could create prob uh, solutions to addressing those problems, no matter my background, my community. I knew that I had a strong background, and no matter what I did, I could somehow improve my community, even if it was to a very small extent. And here a follow-up question that comes from the, the ED there, uh, who wants to know, was there one moment, was there one inspirational moment for you? I think not necessarily, and I don't think that a lot of girls that are interested in STEM should always look for that one moment that their um, that idea is going to come, because that's obviously not going to encourage involvement, that STEM is a difficult process. Mm -hmm. It's something that doesn't just come from one amazing um, Yahoo moment. It comes from a long time of failures, of not achieving what you want, and re-looking re at the drawing board and, board and creating something better. So I didn't have that moment, and I'm pretty sure a lot of other people don't have that moment. Um, but what I created, which I think was Pumzile's question, was a polymer to help plants combat mm -hmm. drought. Mm -hmm. Um, which South Africa and over 66% of the world was experiencing at the time. Mm -hmm. And current solutions were not low cost, they were not biodegradable. So what I created was a biodegradable and low cost solution to help plants combat drought. You are amazing, <laughs> isn't she? <laughs> amazing. Amazing, amazing, amazing. From being amazing at a young age to being amazing a little older. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Halfler, thank you for being with us. You are an engineer, a bricklayer, you're in a space that is predominantly or traditionally dominated by men. Engineering construction, infrastructure development. Can you tell us a bit about your experience, your journey, and, and what you see as the unique role women can play in this space? Yeah, thank you so much. I, I grew up in a, a blue collar, very small town in the cornfields west of Chicago, and. Uh, neither of my parents went to college, and I, uh, kind of like Lorraine, never thought I would end up here. So thank you so much for the honor. It's just such a, a, a fabulous, fabulous honor to be here. Um, but so my sister and I spent our summers working for my dad's small business in the construction industry, building houses. Um, we were bricklayers. We still are bricklayers. And it, it felt like the most natural thing in the world. It was just to work in the family business, to, to learn a trade. It's so rewarding and so physically gratifying. At the end of the day, you could see what you'd built. And, but I can't cook either, so. <laughs> it's I, a trend. It's I can a build a house, but I can't cook. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you. So when I was in grad school studying civil engineering at UC Berkeley, I'm a little, I feel a little outnumbered <laughs> with all the Stanford folks here. <laughs> um, there was an earthquake in Gujarat, India that killed about 20,000 people. And uh, most people died because their house collapsed on them. And this made me angry. Uh, housing is a basic human right. And people were dying because of lack of wealth, lack of political will, lack of knowledge, lack of rebar. And we often say it's not the earthquake that kills people, it's the collapse of a poorly built building. So this is a man-made problem, so there has to be a woman-made solution. <laughs> so. <laughs> but we do have to think equal from, from the very start. Build Change has six core principles, and the first one is equality. 
And so when we, we started our first program in Aceh, in Indonesia, after the Indian Ocean tsunami, and the first thing we did was hire a female Achenese structural engineer and a female Achenese quantity estimator. And then we decided we were going to try to change the way the NGO community delivers housing after disasters and try to shift away from sweat equity where you just give the house to someone, they don't get to make decisions about materials and architecture, and they just have to do the hard labor. Switch that to decision equity. Mm -hmm. So we asked the community to make sure that all of the, all of the adult homeowners, members of the household were, were there for the decision making process all the adult family members, so the women, the men, the elderly, disabled, everyone, so that they could make decisions about where is the kitchen, where is the toilet. And I remember in the first cohort of families that we worked with, uh, one of the village leaders said, well, there's this, a single mom with four kids, her husband's gone, just leave her alone, make the decision for her. There was no way we were gonna do that. So, so we enabled her to make the decisions just like every, anyone else, and she was one of the most engaged homeowners in the, in the process, regularly checking construction quality, pushing wheelbarrows of dirt around on the construction site. And, it was, and this is the philosophy that we've held to throughout the entire history of our work. Um, so when we're making decisions about housing, women tend to prioritize safety and security and basic features such as kitchens and toilets uh, more than men. And we need them leading this decision-making process because I find that women really are looking to reduce risk and, risk and keep their families safe. Did you know that inventions like the fire escape, windshield wipers, Kevlar vests, life rafts, these inventions were invented by women. Wow. So <laughs> women, yeah. <laughs> So like Dr. Ochoa said, women, girls love to solve problems. Mm -hmm. And I think we have a natural tendency to apply our, our thinking to keeping people safe and mm -hmm. keeping our families safe. So we do have a strong role to play in safer, stronger homes and in building smart. Thank you for that. I had no idea about the Kevlar vest, mm -hmm. having worn one of those. Yeah. <laughs> it's incredibly heavy. Um, but um, thank you. Thank you for sharing. I want to go back to um, Pen Penelope Beckles at this point so that you can maybe go back to your home country and give us some more perspective. I know that we see in, in, um, in the Caribbean, um, women are well known for being in the workforce, of, for being involved in education, but they are facing barriers to entry in STEM. Can you talk about some of the, the, the unique challenges that they face? Well, you know, what is interesting is that with the, uh, with the advancement of women, uh, and women taking up the opportunities that are available to them. One of the interesting discussions taking place now in the Caribbean is that of male marginalization and why women are performing so well. Um, and that's, that's very interesting for a lot of countries who may be looking to, for women to advance. Sometimes what could be the backlash, uh, and the backlash is that rather than continuing to encourage women to do well, you begin to think that there may be some reason when the men start underperforming that there is something to do with how women are advancing. Mm -hmm. um, and that is a discussion. I mean, there's now actually a lot of research, both the University of the West Indies and a number of governments are actually researching. And therefore you find that some women are beginning to feel very conscious of this of the underperformance of the men and well what is you know I don't know I don't understand the concept of overperformance because as far as I'm concerned if you're if you go to school or you go to university and you're doing well you are doing well so I think that's one of the main challenges and following from that would be of course the issue of domestic violence mm -hmm. that you see cropping up from time to time in uh, many countries, um, sometimes related to the fact that some men are not able to deal with the issue of advancement of women. And that is one of the areas that we have had to, to address. Um, legislation, of course, has been put into place in most countries, but it, it's a matter of concern. Mm. Thank you for that. Yes. Uh, Lorraine, to you, and, and, and zeroing in on Google once more, um, can you tell us a little bit about the courage to question uh, project that is being launched today and Google's role in storytelling efforts like this. Uh, 
I, I would love to uh, talk a little bit more about this wonderful, wonderful work we've been doing together with UN Women. First of all, I should say we are big fans of UN Women and all of the, all of the team there. That's why I'm proud to share today that we've signed the UN Women Empowerment Principles. Um, it's, it's proud that we, we've, we've signed that. that I think was we should celebrate that. Uh, thank you. Thank you, and, and I hope we do a lot, we do a lot more, more together. It's the beginning of a journey together. As Google's chief storyteller, I know the power of our platforms. We reach billions of people every single day, and so I know we have the ability to shine a big and a very bright spotlight on these remarkable women around the world uh, who are raising up women and girls and to bring their stories to a, to a lot more people. That's, that's, this is what, what I do uh, every day. Uh, for example, today on our homepage, our most visible asset, it's seen by billions of people, we are sh sharing the stories of women all, all around the world, so, so please uh, check it out. Um, Courage to Question is an example of that. It, it is um, a, a project we've done with Young Women and Vital Voices, and it, it's a four-part um, virtual reality series uh, which tells the story of four women who are women, women's rights defenders who are combating mass incarceration, ch uh, child marriage, uh, vi gender-based violence, um, uh, human trafficking. I'd like to t t tell, talk about the, those, those four women, three of whom are here. Mm -hmm. um, Miss Alice, uh, I'll mention first. Miss Alice Johnson was given a, a life sentence in prison without parole for first-time nonviolent drug offense. Um, she came to speak at a, at a human rights event that we organized at Google, uh, organized by Malika, our wonderful general counsel of human rights, who is here with me. But I say she came to speak. She came to speak through Google Hangouts because she was still in prison. Um, uh, Mike.com saw her there, wrote a piece about it. It went viral. Kim Kardashian saw it, and the rest is history. She's now out of prison and a huge advocate for, for against mass incarceration. She's quite the force, as Alice is here. Can you here. Um, wave and just say anyone yeah. who doesn't... Um, if you haven't met Miss Alice, she's quite the force. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> Chief Teresa Kachendawoto is, is from Malawi. Malawi is the country with the most uh, child marriage uh, cases. And she is a leader in, in, in Malawi. And she changed the law working with the men in her community so that child marriage was no longer allowed. Um, ext extraordinary stories, many stories, many things that she's done. One of the things she has done is roll back 850 child marriages just in her local community, which is, is remarkable. Lydia Cachao, who is also here from Mexico. Lydia. Lydia is a... <laughs> Lydia. Lydia is a journalist of 30 years uh, uh, representing uh, women's rights. Uh, despite many, many death th threats uh, and intimidation, she continues to explore and, 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 exploit and, and share the, the, the abuses against women and, and, gir and girls in, in Mexico, and her, her work is remarkable. And then Asha Kautal, who's also here from India. Asha. And Asha is the General Secretary of the Dalit Women's Rights Movement in India. The Dalit women face systemic discrimination and violence against them all the time, and Asha fights for them and on their behalf every single day. So it's wonderful to have Miss Alice, Lydia, and Asha here with us today. Um, but these stories shown in virtual reality, so full immersion, uh, allow us to sort of know and feel the power and courage of these amazing women. And, and to me, they're a great example of the best of technology and humanity together. It, it, you know, virtual reality allows you to, to have this full immersion. It allows you to go more proximate, to really feel like you're there, even, even though that may feel uncomfortable in, in some of the scenes. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think that's really important because it's the only way that we, that we get more empathy in the world today, by really experiencing these stories firsthand. So I would encourage you to go to the VR exhibit in the lobby downstairs, but in the meantime, we're going to show, I think, a little trailer mm -hmm. of, the st of the stories of these remarkable women. What if women and girls could live free from violence and live out their full potential? What if we reimagined a world where every woman, where every girl is treated with dignity and justice? There are women fighting for that world to come and their courage must be known. These are their stories. I am the first woman chief in my area who paved the way for others. I was the first time non-violent offender that was sentenced to life without parole. 
When we work towards eradicating human trafficking, we will change the world. Injustice is injustice, whether it be caste, class, or any other form of oppression. It is a critical time, and in order to understand the need for dignity and rights for women and girls, we should get closer, see the world through their eyes, feel their courage to question, and take action. When you see a face, when you see another human being, that changes things. I have a voice, and I have the courage to speak up, to question. To create change. Together, we can end child marriages. Dalit women fight. I fight against human trafficking. For 21 years, I never stopped fighting. It is time to come together and fight for a new narrative. Those are like incredible stories. I just want to reiterate what Lorraine said. On the way out, you can grab some Google cardboard VR glasses, go downstairs, go to the exhibit, take a look at these films and fight. Let's keep the fight going. Um, I also want to uh, pose a question to Kiara. Um, you're from South Africa. You've done incredible things at a young age, and there's so much more you're about to do, I know. I'm, I should be watching you closely. How important is it for girls from uh, underrepresented communities to get involved in STEM, and what difference does it make? I think that every idea fundamentally has the power to change our world. And we see that today where a lot of the times we have communities where we as girls don't want to speak up. And if we don't speak up, what that means is that we're living in communities that don't have our decisions reflected in them. And for, for instance, like science fairs, um, the Google Science Fair, for instance, has been amazing and encouraging girls that feel intimidated to show their ideas and realize that no matter how small their ideas is, are, they can make a change. And living in a society where key decision makers in households are women, where we see that it's not necessarily translated into jobs, for instance, where we have 50% of professional occupations occupied by women, we see only 25% of those in the computer science space. And as somebody that's very interested in innovation and technology, I know that when we're getting girls involved in innovation and change, that it's not just something that girls should be proud of or girls should be pushing for, because when we get them involved, we're going to get better solutions. We're going to get more solutions, solutions that are improving our communities in a diverse range of ways. And that's why we should be getting girls involved in science and it should be an agenda on everybody's, what everybody wants to do. That's why it's so important. Thank you. Um, speaking of agendas, um, Elizabeth, you shared a, a data point with us that the World Bank estimates that three billion people will be living in substandard housing by 2030. Why isn't that a bigger part of the development agenda? Uh, and talk to me about the role of women in, in, in shifting that. Yeah, so again, it's such an honor to join this panel and celebrate International Women's Day and sit here, especially in this place of so much peace and reconciliation. I, I suspect that very few of us are worried about the roof collapsing, mm. right? Yet 1.5 billion women have to live with that constant threat of their roof collapsing and in just a matter of, few, of a few minutes in an earthquake or, or a hurricane and you know, becoming homeless, becoming exposed to trafficking or violence, losing their asset, losing their place of business, maybe losing their child, right? 1.5 billion women have to live with that, with, with, with that threat. I, I think we've long moved past the idea of a woman's place is in the home. A woman's place is everywhere. It's in space. It's in, in the media. It's uh, in Congress. It's in the coding hub. It's in the lab. It's in the C-suite. But housing 
remains a women's issue, right? Because it's a place of security. And so in addition to celebrating women on this day, I, I feel like we, we should observe what we haven't done. And we haven't succeeded in pr protecting women in their own homes. Uh, from mothers from Medellin to Manila are struggling to put safe roofs over their heads. So why aren't we doing more? Why isn't housing part of the global development agenda? And the answer is, is both a complex one and a very simple one. And the complex one is that if we're really going to build smart and innovate for change, then we need to change how infrastructure projects are funded and prioritized. We need to move past, go beyond looking at these projects through a very narrow lens of profit and instead expand our view to include resilience. Because if we look at housing projects through a resilience lens, then we'll, we'll recognize that it is worth investing $3,000 to improve a house that it would cost $20,000 to replace. The financial argument is subtle, but it's there. It's worth preserving, preserving the asset. It's worth saving the lives. It's worth limiting, limiting impacts on the climate um, because we're able to strengthen homes rather than building new. But the simple answer to this question is one that's already been said, and that's that we need more women in key decision-making positions. Several years ago, I heard Hillary Clinton make the remark that in order to make change at scale, we need to change policy. So if we're really going to build smart and innovate for change, we have to change housing policies, we have to increase housing access, we have to use the best technologies that are available. We're using VR to enable homeowners to not only visualize their improved house, but to rapidly uh, make the whole design proce process more efficient and faster so that we can reach, so that we can reach scale. Um, it's a very complex issue, and it requires leadership. And here in my country, there have been only two directors of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development in its 50 years history, only two, serving for four years under the Ford, or, the Ford and Carter if, administrations. And I'm not aware of any female director of the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA. So we need to make changes at these high leadership levels, and we need to stay in, we need to stay in leadership positions. So my father, as a bricklayer, taught me how to lay bricks, but by doing so, he taught me something that was even more profound, which is that beautiful and great things can come from small steps implemented with attention to detail and with love. So this is how we as women are going to work together, together to build the future that we want, brick by brick. Very, very well said, very well said. To bring this panel to a close, I'd like to turn it over to the Executive Director of UN Women for closing remarks. Thank you very much. Um, I really first want to start by thanking everybody um, who is here, and uh, your presence has contributed to make sure that uh, not only do we explore the theme, but uh, we feed off each other's energy, right? Right? Uh, I mean, I'm not so sure who those ladies are with their crowns, but they are giving me some energy. Yeah. Give them a shout out. Uh, we have a lot of young people in the room today giving us a lot of energy. Anyone who's under 25, please stand up. Thank you for being here because there's a bait on waiting for you, so don't, don't run away. <laughs> we have people here who are human rights defenders, activists, who have given all their lives to nothing else but this struggle. And we have been fighting maybe sometimes by ourselves with limited resources, that exhausting fundraising that we all have to do. But we are now saying we have to leverage those who have the resources and the infrastructure to do the change, to do the change themselves. Google must tell the story about human rights defender, because I don't have the capacity to tell all the stories of all the women that need to be told. They can. Am I right or am I right? You bet. Right. <laughs> and, and we also recognize the importance of being organized. 
and using whatever capacities that bring us together to leverage uh, the skills that we have and the contacts that we have and the influence that we can bring about. I think in this room today, for instance, we have the president of an organization here in the US called uh, Lynx, which organizes women who are professionals with capacity to use that to go around making changes for other women. We have in this room women who are part of the civil society that we work with as UN women, which is pretty much everybody. I want you to stand up and give yourself a big applause. So my, my, my parting words is also that you're never too young to start. The point that we wanted to make today was that innovation was not for the uh, veterans only, you can start as early as a teenager. This is a losing proof. It cannot be more convincing than it is on this platform today. But also that we must not accept any limits. Even space is our space, right? <laughs> and we need to make sure that because we represent governments, uh, uh, well, I'm not in government, by the way. Uh, but we are an intergovernmental body. We must facilitate policies that change the world because technology is not neutral. Technology can exacerbate inequalities, but technology also can close the gap. But we have to be inten we have, we have shared the, the intention to bring about change and to use technology appropriately. So what we were trying to do today was to exchange ideas and show examples of where technology offers possibilities that sometimes we don't take and that we need to do something to close that gap. We also wanted to appreciate that the fact that young people have talent, that young people can be role models we therefore need to create the space to put them on the pedestal so that other young people can be inspired by them. And today, again, Ju was here. She sang her heart out. She sang her heart out. And, and how cool is that? So today was just all about uh, inspiring uh, one another and recognizing how far more we still have to go, but also that we cannot go slowly. We cannot go small. The problems are just too big. We need to leapfrog and we need technology that can change lives of not just millions, but billions. So everyone who's here on this platform and everyone who's in the room, let's find that space where we can actually make change happen in a big way, not in a small way, please. We threw it small, making change in a big way. Thank you. To say a brief word of thanks before our musical performers, our final musical performers sing their hearts out, please welcome the director of UN Women's Coordination Division and the event organizer of International Women's Day, Aparna Merotra. Well, thank you very much. Today is International Women's Day. Happy International Women's Day. And it's a day of celebration, and it's a day for everybody to shine. So there are a few people I need to make shine. And so I will be spending a minute doing that. First of all, we all know that we have a master of ceremonies and they actually are the master of the show. We know that Shade has helped us and worked with us and expressed solidarity with us mul for multiple, on multiple International Women's Day. You've seen how well she shines and how well she makes us shine. So first and foremost, I would like to give a very large and loud round of applause for Shade.
solidarity beats everything. And without it, we can do nothing. I'd also like to express my gratitude to Isha. Where's Isha? Thank you very much. She, she's moderated a wonderful panel where we've heard wonderful stories and we express our gratitude to you. May you shine. We, of course, would like to thank all our presenters, our keynote speakers, our senior UN officials, all of you who have made the day special today. It's a special day. You need to feel special. You need to do something special and understand that we truly are special. And every day we can be special. So thank you to every one of those people. Um, and please go out, leave this room, and do something for yourself. Today is your day. Um, finally, I have to express my thanks to the village. We cannot undertake a event of this magnitude without a very large number of very, very hardworking staff and volunteers. So I will take this moment to request all the staff and all the volunteers who have supported you to make this day what it is so far. So please stand up and accept the round of applause. <laughs> and finally, um, and this is off script, um, I'd like to, you all know that science education is fundamental and has made many of the people who they are. And we, we, many of us, are who we are because of Stanford. Stanford has Dr. Achua, Stanford has Kiara, and Stanford has 30 people here in the aisles who are listening to us and are Stanford alums and have come to express their solidarity with us. So thank us all from Stanford. And just to end this, I have to say that we know someone here is from UC Berkeley. <laughs> now, I d when I, were I at Stanford, I would have poo-pooed them. But now that I'm at the UN, I, I'm not allowed to do that. I have to be impartial. So I will tell you that my son is an engineer from Berkeley, and so you are accepted. <laughs> So thank you very much, everybody. Happy International Women's Day, and thank you for being here. Thank you, Aparna, I just love you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, now to close this wonderful celebration of International Women's Day, we have a traditional musical treat. The UN Women Anthem was created to mark the occasion of UN Women's founding and performed at the inaugural. Today, it is fitting that we actually close our program with the performance of our anthem sung by members of the Broadway stage. Up her voice in Lahore, La Paz, Kampala, though she's half a world away. Something in me wants to say We are one woman, you cry, and I hear you. We are one. Teaches others how to. In Jaipur, she gives her name. 
home she lives without shame in manila salta and and join us in song. Put your hands together and join in. You guys are incredible. Andrea, thank you so much. Nakenji, Zoe, Bly, Brian, thank you all so much. Well, thank you all for coming here today to celebrate International Women's Day. What a great day this has been, hasn't it? So continue to be champions of change. Think big. And remember, we have to increase the number of women who are decision makers. So important. Keep pushing ahead. We still have a lot of work to do. And remember, give that young girl a geometry set or a microscope. Yeah. 
okay? Thank you all so much. Uh, continue to shine, and we hope to see all of you again next year. Again, happy International Women's Day. Thank you.